Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post. This week, Thailand. Is this a real coup? And where the coup has left journalism in that country. Three major newspapers in Spain all replaced their chief editors. Politics or economics or both. Julian Assange and Glenn Greenwald, for once, they're not on the same page. And Japan is not a backwards country. It just looks that way in our web video of the week. Thailand and its media are under the control of the army once again. The coup d'etat declared May 22nd, Thailand's fifth since 1977, brought an end to another democratically elected government. The last time this happened was in 2006 when Thaksin Shinawat, a business tycoon with major media holdings, was overthrown. This time it was his sister Yinglak being ousted, although Thaksin was seen as the exiled power behind the throne, so to speak, pulling the strings from Dubai. Thailand's new military leader is General Prayuth Chan Ocha, and when martial law was declared on the general's orders, nearly half of the provisions in that law dealt specifically with the Thai media and freedom of expression. Since then, some journalists have been arrested, others have been schooled on how to report the coup all intended to put a lid on a media debate that's partisan and often highly politicized. But is this a temporary setback for media freedom in Thailand or a sign of more permanent things to come? Our starting point this week is Bangkok. May 20th and the Thai military declares martial law. It's 2014, but the announcement by General Chan Ocha, made at a desk to a single camera against a drab background, looked like something out of the 1970s. That same day, all television and radio stations, except the military channel, are shut down. Three days later, the operators of the country's ISPs, its internet service providers, are called in and given their marching orders by the military. As one official explained, this is not censorship at all, but a blockade of only content or websites, which may cause conflict and unrest and a threat to national security. The next day, May 24th, there was a similar meeting, with the army calling in the editors of 18 major newspapers. In the space of just five days, the media in Thailand, mainstream TV and radio, new media, as well as print, all saw the rules of reporting change. So when the martial law was declared on 20th of May, uh, it was clear that one of the targets that they wanted to control was the media. What is different from the previous coup is that in the past it was uh, targeted at the red faction. But in this case, we've seen that the uh, orders have gone out to the media of both factions, the competing ones, so the red and the yellow. And here we're talking about particularly Asia Update, which is associated with the red shirt movement of former Prime Minister Thaksin Shinawat, or for example, the blue sky channel which is closely associated with the PDRC, the protesters who were occupying parts of Bangkok for several months from November and December onwards. Those stations are much more partisan, agitating the masses and, and moving things in particular directions. <laughs> So the military is uncomfortable with this kind of television station. In the first order, it was a blanket ban on everyone. Since then, they have lifted the suspension for the cable uh, free-to-air uh, stations, but it's under strict conditions. So there are limits to what content can be aired, there are limits to who they can interview, and also there's basically a prohibition to air content that would be critical of the decisions that have come. And I think that this is really to sort of stop any more of the uh, contents that they think would be uh, divisive. The new government issued 12 provisions in its martial law declaration, a 12-step program of sorts to rehabilitate Thai democracy. Some of those provisions were standard martial law fare, the imposition of a curfew limiting public gatherings. But six of the 12 provisions related directly to the media a reflection of where the country's new leaders think that any challenge to their rule may come from. The past few years of Thai politics, uh, various media, you know, whether radio, uh, televisions, uh, these social medias and so on, have taken a sort of very uh, partisan position, supporting the government side and uh, some support the anti-government side. And I think that uh, has led to uh, more antagonism. So what the military is trying to do is the, for the media to report on, on the facts, on the actual situation, 
to be more informative rather than to pose questions that might lead to more anger. And they don't want to encourage people to, to stand up and, and oppose the military but also with the foreign media. They don't want the kind of debates that normally take place on foreign media between those who oppose to the coup and those who support the coup to take place. Is there a real coup going on? Please, please tell us. Please, 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 please go to Is this a real coup? coup? No, 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 no. Sorry, I, I don't know anything. They're worried that people in Thailand will see this, but they're also, they don't want too much made of this whole issue of, of whether or not the coup is justified or not. I've covered three coup d'etat, and I've observed that military control of the media is exerted in the beginning to try to get us to adapt our reporting within a certain framework. It doesn't mean that they will control us for the long term. It wouldn't be possible anyway. There has never been any junta in the past that has been successful in doing so. The media landscape in Thailand today took shape in the late 1990s when the government first allowed privately owned channels to share the airwaves with the state-owned broadcaster, Thai PBS. But the big change came in 2000 when Taksin Shinawad, a business tycoon who already owned the country's largest mobile phone provider and a cable TV company, bought an ailing television channel, ITV, and made it his own. One year later, in 2001, he was elected prime minister. Shinawat's understanding of how modern media work and the fact he owned so much media paved his way to power in Bangkok. Taksin was one of the people who really saw the potential of mobile phones and satellites to transform uh, the way that messages reached people. He used radio to communicate to people very strong messages and also to empower new groups of voters who had been neglected by previous leaders. And that's one of the key reasons why pro-Taxan parties were able to win every election that's been held in Thailand since 2001. In fact, we had less freedom of expression as a result of Taksin's growing control of the media. Taksin used his influence with editors to shape the coverage. The media felt pressured into complying. So to now claim that the media has lost its freedom of expression as a result of the coup d'etat is not right. We've had our freedom of press infringed upon for a long time since Taksin's era. The question now becomes how long until the Thai media are allowed to operate freely once again? How long until democracy is restored? On May 26th, General Chen Ocha met the media for the first time and showed little tolerance for their questions. <laughs> end of news conference, as well as end of media freedom in Thailand, at least for the time being. I am not speaking in favor of the coup. I believe in freedom of expression. But if democracy as we see it is hurting us, if someone who comes into power doesn't govern under the principles of democracy as practiced in the West and instead drags the country backwards, the media sector needs to re-evaluate its understanding of democracy and allow for a group of people to come in and reform the system. However, if the junta drags its feet and holds on to power, the media won't stand for it. The threats to freedom of expression in Thailand, particularly with the media, exacerbates everything. The military control exacerbates everything. It is not a temporary situation. The threats facing the media internally and externally will continue there also needs to be a reform, but it cannot come from the military. It has to come from the media, about media itself. Our Global Village Voices now on the current state of journalism in Thailand. Thai military had to control the media to stop the escalating tension in the country, potentially fueled by unconfirmed reports in the media. Um, I think some of these reports may have played a contributing role in the current situation the country is facing and as a result the military felt that the media had to be kept in check. Um, but I don't think this has made a difference to the situation in the country because the ease of access that social media provides does make it possible for news coverage to bypass the mainstream media and get right to the user. In each of Thailand's military-led coups, there have been restrictions placed on media and efforts made to silence criticism and dissent. Yet in some ways, so far, this coup is proving unique. Recent developments have seen the army display almost a complete disregard for maintaining even the appearance of a free press in Thailand. 
For now, Thailand remains a deeply polarized country with a deeply polarized media. For the press in Thailand, it seems the situation is likely to become far worse before it gets better. Time now for Listening Post News Bites. An Italian photojournalist and his Russian fixer have become the first media workers killed in eastern Ukraine since the start of the fighting there. Andrea Rokelli and Andrei Miranov were caught in mortar fire May 24th. A French photographer, William Rogolon, was also wounded in that attack, but he survived. Rokelli co-founded a photo collective called Cesura in 2008. He had already covered Afghanistan and the Arab Spring for outlets including Le Monde, Foreign Policy, and Novaya Gazeta and Commerçant in Russia. The London-based independent newspaper reports that media workers are routinely taken hostage in eastern Ukraine and that nearly every day since the beginning of April, a new missing persons report is filed by the families of working journalists. Two Russians, Marat Saichenko and Oleg Sidyakin, were both taken on May 18th and held for almost a week. Upon their release, they warned other journalists of the mortal danger of working in Ukraine. Two Pakistani newspapers, the Daily Jung and the News, have joined the chorus of media outlets there that have criticized GOTV for its reporting on the ISI, Pakistan's National Intelligence Service. The twist in the story is that the two newspapers are owned by the same company that owns GEO. GEO News ke anchor person or senior Sahafi Hamid Mir. The initial story back in mid-April was on the shooting of Hamid Mir, a GOTV anchor who survived the attack, which he, his family, and GEO all blamed on the ISI. The paper initially echoed those accusations in their reporting, but then in identical front page statements published May 26th, both described their coverage of the Mir case as excessive and emotional. GEO has come under a continuous barrage of criticism accused of false, malicious and irresponsible reporting by the Ministry of Defense. The channel has also been threatened with prosecution and been pushed to the bottom of the TV listings by Pakistani cable networks. Egyptians are getting the feeling that they may have seen the last of Bassem Yusuf. The comedian and his influential weekly program, El Burnameg, were taken off the air back in April as the presidential election campaign kicked off. The channel involved, the Dubai-based Saudi-owned NBC, said at the time that Yusuf would return May 30th, just after the vote, because NBC was keen on respecting the electoral process so that Egyptian voters' orientation and public opinion won't be influenced by Yusuf. Four days before the planned return, the channel and Yusuf's team suddenly announced the show would not be back. They gave no indication if it ever would come back, saying only that they would have more to say on the subject sometime. Insert punchline here. <laughs> A slight crack has appeared in the alliance between Julian Assange of WikiLeaks and Glenn Greenwald, he of the Edward Snowden NSA story, who's now at a new media venture called The Intercept. Greenwald edits The Intercept, which published a story May 19th based on more leaked Snowden documents, which said there are five countries in which the U.S. is capturing all information from private mobile phone calls. It named four of those countries, but left the last one blank. Spoiler alert. The fifth was Afghanistan. We know that because WikiLeaks reported it and then went on to accuse The Intercept of censorship. A Twitter dust-up then ensued with The Intercept saying the omission came at the request of the U.S. government and that its editors decided releasing the information could put unnamed people at risk. Glenn Greenwald has been a big fan of Julian Assange's over the years and when Greenwald's NSA source Edward Snowden was seeking asylum in Moscow, some key WikiLeaks staffers were sent there from London to help him out. So this editorial disagreement between the two and what comes of it will be worth watching. In the seven and a half years we've been producing The Listening Post, we've looked at the media in many Spanish-speaking countries through our coverage of Latin America, but we've never really taken a close look at Spain and the media there. What got our attention changes at the top of three of the most influential Spanish newspapers. Three editors-in-chief let go in just three months at El País, El Mundo and La Vanguardia. This story has angles both political and economic. The changes at El País and El Mundo came on the heels of their coverage of a corruption story that has had the government there on the ropes. And Spanish papers have been feeling the effects of a wider financial crisis as well as competition from the Internet. Then there is the issue of conflicts of interest. Banks that have loaned the newspapers the money the papers need to survive end up owning shares in those media outlets. So how hard can the new editors of those newspapers push on the coverage of the financial sector and its relationship 
with Spanish politics. The Listening Post's Marcela Pizarro now from the Spanish capital, Madrid. We are in the middle of um, a lot of storms. Our own economic crisis, the whole European economic crisis, and the media crisis. We've gone through difficult situations where many very experienced journalists have lost their jobs as a result of the austerity measures. These are the times we have had to live through. We didn't choose them. Every time someone is replaced because of political or economic interests, the ethics of journalism deteriorates. What we can expect from El Mundo, La Vanguardia and El País is a loss of journalistic quality, a loss of objectivity. And we have to survive uh, in the middle of all these storms. Last year, Spanish newspaper El Mundo had its own Watergate when it broke a huge political story, the Barcenas affair. It was the story of secret cash payments to politicians from a slush fund, text messages that implicated Prime Minister Mariano Rajoy and had him fending off calls for his resignation. But it wasn't the Prime Minister who resigned. It was El Mundo's founder and editor, Pedro J. Ramirez, who had to step down. Ramirez said the reasons for his firing were political. But Pedro Jota, as he's known, is not the only editor-in-chief to have been shown the door recently. First, there was José Antich of La Vanguardia. Then, there was Javier Moreno of El País. All in the space of three months. For the two most important papers in the country, El País and El Mundo, the moves are about plummeting sales. They've fired a lot of people, they've cut wages significantly, but they still have financial problems. At La Vanguardia, Spain's third most important paper, the reasons are different. The editor was pro-independent in the region of Catalonia. The owner was not, and so he replaced him. There is always politics behind a newspaper, uh, and there is always economic power behind a newspaper. But I guarantee you there is nothing politic uh, or economic or whatever kind of factic power behind the change of the editor of El País. Es verdad. It is true that the decision was taken at the time when El Mundo was being very critical of the government. Fundamentally, in the Barcenas affair and within the establishment, there was a consensus against our paper. But the final decision was a corporate one. Spain's mainstream press has had so many money worries, it's been hard to focus on journalism. Since the 2008 financial meltdown, Advertising revenues have shrunk by 60%. Dozens of media outlets have closed and thousands of employees have been laid off. Add to that the steep drop in circulation due to the rise in free digital alternatives, the paper's new directors are under some serious pressure to change things. Así nosotros estamos matando al papel. The problem is that we're committing suicide by charging for newspapers and not for online content. The public needs to realize that information cannot be free if it's going to be good. Quality journalism costs money. If advertising doesn't recover, we will have to charge the public or find an alternative, but we haven't found it yet. Like all other media, we encourage reading for free via the internet. But in the last few months, we established a paywall, similar to that of the New York Times. But on other platforms, like mobile technology, we still have to develop new sources of revenue. For Spain's news consumers who are skeptical of the written press, they could turn to TV. But there have been upheavals there, too. When the Rajoy government came to power in 2011, a purge of state-owned TV followed. Large-scale redundancies, a trail of well-known journalists fired, and the removal of TVE's director, Fran Llorente, whom the Conservative government accused of liberal bias. It wasn't the first time that an incoming government had changed things up at TVE. What was unprecedented was the extent of the restructuring. At a time when Spain's public has lost a lot of faith in its key institutions, judicial, economic, political, even the monarchy, it's the media's duty to hold those institutions to account. But for Spain's mainstream press, being that reliable watchdog 
is proving to be a challenge because that crisis of credibility extends all the way to their doorstep. El País, founded in the post-Franco era, gained a reputation as the newspaper of democratic Spain. But its owners, Brisa, are facing debt problems and are partly owned by the banks, including Santander. That relationship has put the paper's journalism under the microscope. Recently, the Rodin family, which runs Santander, was investigated for tax fraud. The story made news around the world. El País buried it deep inside the paper. What is clear is that a newspaper that is completely dependent on someone who finances it is not going to question them. Self-censorship kicks in. I won't be reporting that story because my boss is going to get angry. And if someone does dare to report it, then the boss will get angry and will take action. The link between economic and financial sectors and the journalistic world means death for reporting. Death for journalism. I mean, relax. Relax. I mean, not, we are not in the verge of destruction of democracy, really. We live in that kind of world uh, where you need money from the banks. But to take a decision here and to lead this uh, newsroom is a different matter. I take the decision of what I'm going to run freely, absolutely freely. Absolutely freely, El País's readers will be the judges of that. Because in this, the age of austerity in Europe, the credibility of the media is just one more commodity that Spaniards are finding in short supply. More Global Village voices now on journalism, particularly on the print side in Spain. Now there is a resurgence of journalism que busca apoyar a los movimientos ciudadanos alternativos eh, por medio de la vía digital. En cuanto a los efectos de la crisis en el sector de la comunicación, hay muchísimos profesionales con muchísimo talento que no encuentran hueco, que están trabajando de freelance o de falsos autónomos con tal de hacerse nombre y tener su firma. Pero es brutal la dificultad que hay para abrirse camino en este mundo. En el fondo, los propietarios son grandes corporaciones, eh, fondos de inversión y bancos que defienden sus intereses. Esto se puede ver, por ejemplo, en el relato que se ha establecido sobre las políticas de austeridad y la crisis. Sí que se habla sobre las consecuencias dramáticas eh, de la crisis y los recortes, pero se deja de lado eh, las soluciones de sentido común y, sobre todo, las causas políticas y económicas. Esto ha afectado también al periodismo, eh, que vive en un momento de grave precarización. Finally, sometime back in the 19th century, Soren Kierkegaard, who was considered the world's first existential philosopher, said, life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. We don't know if the makers of this next video have ever read Kierkegaard or if it just seems that way, but their idea was simple. Film someone walking backwards through the streets of Tokyo and then play that footage in reverse, which makes it look like he's walking forwards and the rest of the city is out of step. The video comes from Sandal, a French duo. It's called Tokyo Reverse. And with nearly 100,000 hits online, we've made it our web video of the week. We'll see you next time at The Listening Post.